started for real. Welcome, everybody. My name is Mina Jane. I'm the director of the Ashland Public Library in Massachusetts. And I am, I can't even tell you how thrilled I'm here to be here with Stan Zimmerman, who's going to be talking about his new book, his first book, The Girls, all about his time with the Gilmore Girls, the Golden Girls, any and yes, in Roseanne. Yes, I know. And Roseanne in the middle. Yes. <laughs> But we're going to get to Stan in just a second. I want to say thank you to the Friends of the Ashland Public Library who support all of our programming. And Stan, who let us partner with other libraries to do this program, and 20 local libraries jumped on board. And yes, when libraries work together, we make magic, TV magic for today. Wow. <laughs> and um, so this is going to be just a Q&A. And so you can put questions in the Q&A, which I will be moderating to Stan when I'm not asking my own, you know, very vital questions. Um, if you want to chat, you can chat with each other all you want in the chat. But it goes by a little bit too fast for me to keep a track of. And, oh, well, I'll be keeping track of it. Oh, <laughs> oh, we'll be talking. You'll get you. You will just find that a huge distraction. Okay. Um, so you can buy signed books from Stan, by Stan from Aesop's Fable. I will put a link to that in the chat because signed books are gold. They're great gifts. And I like, I like collecting them. So Stan Zimmerman, you are, let me get this right, uh, producer, director, screenwriter, and now a debut author of this book, The Girls. Dancer, Why? DJ, sexiest <laughs> man alive. Come on, there's a lot more there. I thought I'd seen you on People Magazine. <laughs> yeah, that was the one. A bartender was... on Andy Cohen's show. Come on, oh, got to add man. that to the resume now. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and you've been traveling the country to, uh, with this book. I, you were on what uh, CBS this morning, today, or yesterday? Uh, no, I was on uh, We Are Austin, uh, CBS uh, morning show in Austin, oh. and that was yesterday morning. Believe it or not. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so yes, whirlwind to book tour. So let's start with a little bit about you. I know that your bio says that you were like this geeky Jewish boy growing up wanting to be a famous actor. Yes. What turned around there? What was it? What was it that made you be like, hmm, I'd rather be behind the camera? Um, well, I pursued acting for a long time. I studied acting uh, at Hampton Playhouse. Hi, Joanne. <laughs> and um, then went to NYU, had to audition to get in, and was in the Circle in the Square drama undergrad program. And then my last year at school, I started going up for a few auditions, and I auditioned for this CBS pilot about pages in Washington. And I did get a call back, but at the audition, I was so nervous, I could feel my face literally shaking that I looked across the room at the casting directors and thought they probably were going to call a par paramedic. Um, I was so nervous. I was very young and just not sure of myself. And that's what made me think, maybe this acting thing isn't for me. And then doors started, suddenly started opening for uh, me and my writing partner, James Burr. We were writing at the same time in between school and after school jobs, writing pilots, and that kind of just kept blowing up. So that's interesting because we know as a library, we um, interview a lot of authors. What made you go towards more screenwriting than book writing? Well, I'm embarrassed to say this in front of you, but I was not a reader as a kid. Um, I watched- This movies. Zoom is over. <laughs> okay, I turn it off. That's right, uh, goodbye people. <laughs> I was scared of the words. I felt in English class, so we, I guess we could blame some of my English teachers, that we were rewarded and gave, given better grades by the more flowery words that we used. And mm -hmm. I was much more of a succinct writer. And, um, but you know, film and TV are a form of art as mm -hmm. well. And some beautiful writers. And I was watching beautiful movies. My mother introduced me to indie movies in Detroit. Um, but I just, that idea of those long paragraphs kind of scared me. Um, and I thought more in terms of dialogue. So very early on uh, in second grade, I was creating my own plays in the basement. Wow. And then I told my second grade teacher who I got to speak to <laughs> through a Detroit news article, the woman, I was telling the story about Mrs. Golden. And she says, well, what's her first name? And I said, Mrs. Like back then we didn't know any teacher's first names. Um, she tracked down Judy Goldman, Golden, and she's my first Golden Girl. 
And um, uh, I got to talk to her and thank her. And she called my mother and suggested that I go to this summer theater program called Cranbrook Theater School in Michigan uh, because I would come up with these plays. And, and uh, she let me perform them with the group in school. She didn't even see them. She trusted me. I don't think teachers would do that today because you wouldn't know what we would come up with. Uh, <laughs> But they were all clean and um, went to Cranbrook Theater School and did not like the plays that they gave me. I thought they were too corny. And so I started rewriting the plays and making them funny. And then when I heard laughter on stage, it was just something shot up the back of my spine. It was like, I have to do this for a living. Mm -hmm. And that's what made me want to do comedy. Um, but I had that issue with I didn't feel I was a writer I was a creator I had a mind but um so I you know was watching Dick Van Dyke's show and I saw how that was a show about writers and they were all in a room together and uh, it wasn't like someone had to go up and write they were all together having fun I thought I could do that but I needed to find somebody else that could compliment me in areas that I didn't uh, excel at yet Mm -hmm. And so I kind of visualized before I knew what creative visualization was and created Jim Berg, my writing partner, and <laughs> met him at NYU and he was a journalism major. So he came at this partnership with words mm -hmm. and I came at it with acting and emotion and arcs of characters. Mm -hmm. And then we're still writing together after all these years, which is crazy. You're yeah. like the Beatles that never broke up. Um, yeah. So, but what, and then what, what drew you and Jim, Jim, right? Jim, yeah. To um, sitcom specifically, because, you know, you could have gone in many directions. I think I just always looked at life in a funny way. My dad said I looked at life through rose colored glasses. I loved sitcoms. I loved anything Norman Lear. Uh, I finally, finally got to meet him uh, a couple of years ago. I never thought I would. I just, cause he kept getting older and I'm like, I, how can I meet him? Um, Wait, wait, wait. How did you meet him? I did meet him through my friend, Kristen Carroll. I wonder if she's on here. Um, hi, Sarah. Um, and um, Shadon. Hi, Shadon. Wow, everyone's here. This is so cool. Um, uh, there was a screening of a movie he had produced, and she said, uh, do you want to go to the screening? It's going to be like six of us, and two of the six is Norman Lear and his wife. And I'm like, I'll be there in two seconds. I, I got to get in the car. And I got to talk to him and tell him, you know, I wrote for B. Arthur. And, you know, obviously he worked with B. Arthur on Maud and All in the Family. And uh, thank him for opening my heart. And it wasn't until he passed recently when I made the real connection to why I have such an affinity now for marrying art and advocacy. When you look at his work, he dealt with really some heavy issues, but in such a funny pop culture way. Mm -hmm. And... I think that was very influential for me. Where else would I've gotten that idea? And I, I do that in my work as well. Mm -hmm. um, so let's jump into the shows that you've been on or have been involved in. So the book is about the girls. So you've worked <laughs> with- One of the lines I wrote, it just, I have, I'm getting a lot of merch now. So <laughs> I make nothing from the merch, even though we wrote that line, but- oh. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, we will be talking a little bit about the production of shows and the some some of the things like residuals and stuff like that. I'm really curious about those. But um, what was the first show that you that was kind of a hit for you that you were a part of, and what was your role? Well, it was Golden Girls was the biggest, the and that was season one. Uh, we did write an episode of a show called Fame. You might have heard of. Um, <laughs> I was won't look forever. That. Yes, I, I won't sing it for you. You do not want that. I could dance okay. it for you. That would that'd be fun. Um, so that was one of my first full circle moments. Um, I had auditioned in uh, during the NYU days uh, for the film of Fame. I went with all my classmates. We skipped school and went to this mass audition, and none of my friends got called back, and I got called in. It's all in the book now. I don't want to give too much away, but I got called in for the director. Mm -hmm. um, and what? <laughs> yeah, Alan Parker. And I didn't know who he was. And I got home and I was like, yeah, there's this British 
man, older man with gray hair. And they'll go, that was Alan Parker, the director. I'm like, thank God I didn't know that because then my face really would have started shaking. Um, but uh, I did not get the part. And uh, much to my chagrin, I came back over the summer uh, back to New York early and moved into my apartment across the street from where they were filming it. <laughs> I had to listen to them singing that song in the streets every day. Torture. torture. Yeah, torture. But I got them back. And yeah. um, uh, so we wrote on the TV series and the episode was directed by the amazing Debbie Allen. Mm -hmm. And the episode featured Janet Jackson. Um, you might have heard of her. And she did her first music video was in that episode. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. But how did you, how did you get into it? Like, how did you get into Golden Girls? I mean, it was obviously it became a big hit, but like, what what was your path? You know, everybody hears it's so hard to get into it that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, I was raised uh, by the idea that you worked if you worked really hard, you could succeed, and there was never really another option. It was just you're going to do it. And I love that that was kind of instilled in me at a, at a young age. Um, but Jim and I just started writing spec scripts for different TV shows. And we wrote a lot of like four of them and we kept, and we got nice responses, but it was never like the one. And people kept saying to us, everybody gets stacks of spec scripts. You have to have something that really sticks out or is special. And um, I our, just ask for people that don't know, including myself, what is a spec script? A spec script means you write it on spec or speculative. You don't get paid. So you write an episode of an existing series to show that you can write existing characters. I see. Hopefully to get on staff. So, you know, we wrote shows like Alice and Facts of Life and Love, Sydney and you know, weird little shows. And then our mentor, Gary Keeper, was working at Paramount and he said, uh, do you want to come see this new show? And because we had no money, we went to tapings of shows. Like mm -hmm. we went to Learn and Shirley, we went to a lot of them uh, to learn. We went to a taxi episode, but we went to this new show about a bunch of weird people that hung out at a bar in Boston. Hmm. Ah. <laughs> it hadn't even been on the air. And Jim and I are listening to the rhythm of that show. And we looked at each other and we're like, we have to write this, we have to write one of these. Mm -hmm. And so we started writing it and I think it came on the air and it was really low rated. Oh. And we thought, oh God, it's not gonna last. Why are we wasting our time? And then it happened that that show and our script kind of exploded at the same time. Mm -hmm. But we were one of the first, if not the only uh, spec cheers that was out there because nobody really knew the show. And that was just the one. It was just all of a sudden we went from not getting any phone calls to suddenly agents are taking us seriously and want to, you know, have lunch with us or drinks or suddenly being offered, you know, let's hang out at the Playboy Mansion. I'm like, yeah, no, but uh, if you want to represent us, I, that that would be okay. So I did get to, I did get to the Playboy Mansion years later, though. <laughs> well, everybody's <laughs> got to go at least once. At least once. And I did steal some... Um, of the uh, notepads by the phone. <laughs> I think I still have one or two of those. Are they in a bunny shape? No, I wish they were. Oh, that would have been good, no. All right, those people are not thinking ahead. But no, no. so would you say that Boston had a very big part in your success? A, sh a little show about Boston. <laughs> a little show about Boston that was a real bar. And, you know, we did our little research and, uh, but it was really interesting. We listened to the way they talked even just when they would come to the bar and hey, 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 Norm. It was like, that wasn't a joke. It was just the way they greeted each other. And I think we just had this ear because there were no scripts to read. It mm -hmm. was just listening on the TV show. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't like a normal show. Normally on sitcoms, you came in and you had a joke. Mm -hmm. And this was not a joke. There's nothing funny about hey, 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 Norm, Cliff. I mean, that was just regular people talking mm -hmm. and we just clued into that for some reason and um i think people responded to oh they get it it didn't seem forced it was comedy that came from character mm -hmm. so that's why you know when we got on golden girls it was like how are we going to write this this is a really funny show we didn't i didn't feel like a comedy writer because i wasn't like a stand-up comic um even when we went to get our first 
job, a job interview, we were out in the waiting room and we heard the writers before us mm -hmm. in the room making them laugh. I mean, they're like, they're doing a stand-up comedy routine and Jim and I, I'll come up with some jokes fast, hurry. I'm like, that's not us. And we just went in and we were who we were and um, we ended up getting the job. Mm -hmm. They liked who you were. Um, so you held up your cup. Is that your, uh, Sarah asked, is that your favorite line from Golden Girls or do you have a different line that is your favorite? Oh my God. Um, you mean that I wrote? Yeah. <laughs> um, that's one of my favorite. That's kind of taken on a life of its own, that mm -hmm. one. Um, there were, uh, there are a lot of them actually. Um, you know, in the flu episode, there's one when Blanche talks about, you know, she feels so sick, but how could she still look so good? Uh, don't make me do my Blanche imitation. Please uh, do, please do. Um, you know, lines like uh, Blanche is doing exercises because she's going on a date with her uh, uh, yoga instructor or whatever it's called. What's it? Yeah, anyway, um, and um, um, B. Arthur says, I the last time I got into a position like that was to give birth. <laughs> I mean, things like that. Um, or in what Blanche, dog years? Mm -hmm. Those were lines that were in our first draft. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, how, and they just stayed, you know, throughout until the filming. Mm -hmm. Well, it brings me to another, a question from Joanne who says, um, how do you know when you're getting it right? Like when a line like that, how do you know it's gonna hit or do you? Where do you see her questions? It's in the Q and A. There's a button at the bottom of your screen that okay. says Q&A, and if you open that up. Oh, there we go. Oh, my God, there's so much happening here. There's all that. Joanne, what are you asking questions for? <laughs> uh, how do you know when you're getting it right? Well, there is no right. There is no wrong. Uh, it's just whoever's in charge thinks it's right or thinks it's right for that moment. I mean, that's the thing. You could always be rewriting and rewriting and re rewriting. You know, when you're on a sitcom, you usually start the table read on a Monday and film it on Friday. Mm -hmm. So then you're done. That's it, folks. So that's why we end up staying late nights. Um, is, there, is there a certain magic, though? Like, is there a moment where you're like, this show is going to make it? Like when you were in Golden Girls or when Gilmore Girls or, uh, you know, like for me, like watching Friends or like some of the shows we talked about. Is there a moment where you're just like, yeah, this one's going to make it? If I knew that, <laughs> um, no, I mean, the conventional wisdom back then was there would be no way that people would want to watch a show about four older women. Mm -hmm. um, that's just not what was on television. I knew it was a great show. I knew it was hysterical. I knew those were the funniest actors ever put together in one room. But that doesn't mean people would love it or watch it. Mm -hmm. That it became this phenomenon is just icing on the cake. And to be able to have, you know, ridden that... Um, that crazy ride, especially during the first year when we're sitting in a room and we're saying, um, you know, we should name Betty White's city where she was from. And we're sitting there looking through phone books and then someone's just saying, Olaf, I don't remember who said it, but we're like, yeah, that sounds good. We'll make sure we can do it legally. Okay. So back then you could not have a Rosen Island in the city of St. Olaf. That would be, then you couldn't do it. But we checked and there was no Rosen Island there. And, and we're, we're now we have um, St. Olaf. Um, somebody says that you look way too young to have been working on these shows, but you and I have talked about this. You're, you were there. It was real. I was there. I, I'm, not, I'm, 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 cat, I'm catfishing all of you. Yes, it's all fake. I was um, there, and there are gray hairs under here to prove it. Jeez. Oh, my God. It's time to get a color again. In the, yeah, very soon. I know. The women have to get Botox. You have to have gray hair. Oh, I just I want to tape everything back here. I do the, uh, the Goldie Hawn facelift. Yeah, no. Allegedly, um, allegedly. Okay, yeah. that's fine. Yes. Yes. <laughs> well, we do want some dirt. So if you have some dirt okay. that you want to share with us, please do it, including what Sarah asked. Can you tell us about the feud between Betty and B? B, uh, B. Well, we're going to write, let me answer the Cheers script one first. Okay. So the Cheers was called Mr. February, and it was about Sam posing for one of those um, calendars, naked calendars for charity. And he didn't want anybody to know. And of course, Diane Chambers came in and caught him. Interestingly enough, we sold that idea to a show called Brothers, which was a Showtime series, one of the first about mm -hmm. a gay brother. Mm -hmm. And so we rewrote that script for that show. All right, you want to get to the meat of it. Let's get yes. to some Betty B stuff. Betty. 
What do you want to know? <laughs> Tell us about the feud. What's going on? Was there a the feud? feud. Um, did it affect this? Did it affect the show? Like, were they fighting, cat fighting in their dressing room? No, you have to understand. I was only there for the first year, so I'm just going to give that impression. <laughs> I, I, you know, I can't really speak on what happened after that. Um, I became very close friends with Estelle. So when you read the book, in it, I have a lot of journal entries from back then. So I kind of compare how I felt then as opposed to now older, somewhat wiser person. So back then, uh, Estelle was terrified of tape night and she would forget a lot of her lines. We did not know that um, she was beginning to experience dementia. We didn't know a lot about dementia then. People did not talk about it back then. Um, and so in the writer's room, everybody thought she just wasn't home studying her lines. She was out, you know, going to benefits and they didn't know it was AIDS benefits. And, um, uh, and so I think they were very frustrated with her. I felt bad because I knew what a panic she was in when it got to Fridays. So she would, you know, forget a line in the middle of taping and they'd have to stop it. And then Betty White would make fun of her in a way. And I got very protective of the, of Estelle. And I was like, for years, I was like, she's, to me, she seemed like Sue Ann Niven. Mm. I just thought it was a bitchy thing to do. Now as an adult, I, and she would go up to the, the stands where the audience was. And now I'm thinking maybe she just went up, made a joke and went up there to take away the attention from Estelle let Estelle collect herself and look at the line with the script people, and then we could film it. Um, you know, when you're young, you just, you have like all these like, thoughts and you know, and you think you're right on everything. And then I think the older you get, you kind of go, oh, well the, there's that perspective of it as well. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, we will never know. I didn't know till years later, the uh, animosity between B and Betty. And it, it never really showed in the first season, I think people were, it's a new job and you're excited and everyone was so thrilled that, that we were being appreciated. Mm -hmm. That was a big deal. And everyone's like going, oh my God, like they, you know, not to quote Sally Field, but they liked us. They really liked us. And um, for all of them to have a hit and for, for Rue McClanahan to be a star of a show when she was probably always thought she was going to be a second banana like she was on, um, you know, on Maud uh, and Estelle to be in plays off Broadway and suddenly be in feature films, you know, with, with Cher, and, you know, it's crazy. Um, but I think it stems from very different um, ways of working. You know, when you're working that intently with people, remember we were doing 24 or so more episodes a season. Mm -hmm. That's really intense. Yeah. And you're there all day um you know b comes from theater and there's just a different way of working when you're rehearsing plays and uh, betty had done some plays actually when i was in the gunkwit at the gunkwit playhouse um last year for uh the gilmore girls fan festival and uh, my friend friend brad kinney actually runs the playhouse and I looked up on the wall and there was a poster for a play that Betty White did with her husband Alan Ludden and I never thought of her as a theater person and then I did some investigating and she had done some theater back in the day. I sort of feel like uh, Betty but, White probably did almost everything it seems like. Yes but she was a real TV baby. Yeah. They say that when literally the television turned on when it was invented there was Betty White. <laughs> she hosted I, I think it's one of the first shows mm -hmm. I think it was Life with Betty or some some show in in LA mm -hmm. um, and so she was early early television so her thing was really sitcoms game shows which is very different than theater and having to learn the whole play and just going through it without stopping right. so I think there are different techniques of working kind of butted heads a little bit so as far as B needed and wanted to stay in character Betty could flip it on and off like that and yeah. it was just like, wow, which is a real talent. Some people can do it. Some people just want to stay in the moment. So I think uh, B also saw Betty going up to the audience and life with Elizabeth. That's what it is. Oh my <laughs> I God. love my crew here. Somebody there that's like right on it. Yeah. Um, 
I think she was like, what are you doing? Like, we're stay in the moment here. Why are you going up there? But she could, she could just do that. Yeah. So God bless her. Well, so you said you were the, uh, there for a year. Yes. What was, what made you leave and what did you go to next? Well, I, we didn't leave voluntarily. I thought I was going to be there. They kept giving us scripts to write. We were, I think on our contract, we were not uh, guaranteed to write any scripts with our names on it. We mm -hmm. had that one that we wrote on freelance, but no others. And then they kept seeing that we could write good first drafts. So any staff loves writers that can bang out a good first draft because then they could really mold it. Mm -hmm. uh, so they kept giving us them. And then at the wrap party for season one, Susan Harris said, see you in a couple months. And so I'm leaving going, it's a good summer. I got another, another year on the contract. Great job. And then you know, we got the call from our agent that, um, you know, they were not picking up our option. Uh, so it was a whole political thing. Uh, from what we learned years later, and it was really hard to tell our friends, like, this was a big job. Everybody knew about it. Um, and there was, like, if we had done a bad job or they didn't like us, but we got nominated for a Writers Guild Award. So it's hard in your head, especially a young person, well, what could I have done differently? Right. And they didn't and tell you, right? They no. So you. There's nothing I could have done. Like yeah. we, we wrote great stuff. Like there, you can't argue with that. It, they're, they're, they're in the show. Mm -hmm. I mean, all those lines are still being quoted and put on coffee mugs. Um, from what I understand from the other writers years later was the writing staff wanted us to stay on. Uh, Paul Witt and Tony Thomas had wanted another writer to go on staff, we both wrote freelance episodes. Hers was rewritten a lot and ours pretty much stayed the same. That's how we got on staff. And they kept, I think they were, their you know, male egos got, you know, a uh, mm -hmm. little hurt there. Uh, so they never took a liking to us. They never really talked to us. They never uh, gave us like, everybody had director's chairs in, in the booth with their names on it. We never did. Mm. Like we'd be forced to just stand around. So little things like that, just, it was hard. And then also we were forced to stay in the closet on the show. So it was, I loved the show, but it was very awkward being there mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the time. So they, and also because it was a hit show, they had every writer being pitched to them. Mm -hmm. So it was like, well, why should we stick with these two people? Like that made us look not great. And, um, even though we did make them look good yeah. uh, and let's try some new people. So there you go. I mean, but it was an early lesson in the politics of, of uh, entertainment, but in any business really. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, so was Roseanne next for you or was it uh, a little bit later? No, um, what was next? We did some freelance episodes Um and but the the job on Golden Girls got us a lot of attention and a lot of offers and what well, people wanted to have us create our own pilots, and so that was very exciting. Um, I had saw Roseanne on the Johnny Carson show one night, and I just I don't know something just made me wake up and I turned it on and she was talking and I thought who is this comic I've never heard anybody talk like that before. And the next day we called our agent and said, can you get us a meeting with her? We think there's something in a TV show for her. And he said, America will never buy a show with the larger woman. And he didn't say it as nicely as that. Yeah. Um, no longer with that agent. And, um, and then shortly after that, she got her deal with Carsey Werner. We got offered to go on staff for that show. Oh, like idiots. We turned them down. Oh, uh, Lori Metcalf and John Goodman were not attached at the time. We had a meeting and there was, there was a lot of disarray and weirdness around it. And I, if you followed the show in the first year and she was fighting with um, the creator of the show and she was fighting with the producers, she eventually didn't allow anybody from Carsey Warner, the producers on set for filming, which is very mm -hmm. unusual. And they wanted us to sign like a seven year deal. And so, you know, we were young and people were like, come up with your own stuff. So we thought like, well, should we go back on a show or come up with our own stuff? And we were excited to kind of see what was in our head. And so we did that for a few years. And then uh, 
I was watching Roseanne and I just thought it was brilliant. I just loved the way um, it dealt with real life. It was really funny and yet it was serious. Um, and uh, so we asked to go back on that show. And at that time, our agent said, well, you're gonna have to write another spec script. And we're like, but we've worked on all these shows. <laughs> they didn't care. We wrote a Roseanne spec mm -hmm. and the conventional wisdom then was you would never get on the show that you wrote a script for because there's no way you could know um, exactly you know how the show runs mm -hmm. but they loved what we did and uh, we got hired on Roseanne yeah someone's saying how it's, it's yeah how all these shows resonate with people decades later a friend of mine said that it's not that just like I worked on three really popular shows but that they're still resonating mm -hmm. um Gilmore Girls was the sixth most watched TV show in 2023. I like, believe how it. Is that possible? <laughs> During COVID, Golden Girls was Hulu's second watched show. Mm -hmm. Well, there's certain a nostalgia about it as well. Um, but of course, we have to know: Are you Team Jess, Logan, or Dean? What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to say Jess. No, uh, I think he's adorable, but I have to say Logan because I was there on season five. Uh, I was walking into the writer's room one morning and I saw two actors sitting out in the little waiting area. And I walked in and I said, who are those two cute boys? And the, Amy Sherman Palladino said, oh, they're the, um, our last two who we're choosing from for Logan. So we were creating Logan in the writer's room. Mm -hmm. And I just like, you gotta hire the blonde one. I don't know. I'm very big. I, I thought felt. I just felt the vibe and the coloring. And I felt he would look good. He just felt like rich money. Mm. I thought he would look good opposite Alexis. And so I don't know why I was pushing him, but and um, he got the gig. Mm -hmm. And so I have since run into Matt Zukri and say, yeah, you owe, owe it all to me. Of course, <laughs> he doesn't, but he's a super talented actor and really cool person. So are any of these people for you like? Like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm working with Amy Sherman Palladino. Or like, was there anybody throughout your history that you were like, that, you know, like you talked about Norman Lee or like, were you like, oh my gosh, I really want to work with that person. The Golden Girls. <laughs> I mean, it was petrifying being around them. Uh, not so much Estelle because um, I had seen her in Torch Song Trilogy and um, she was just, just this like Jewish mother, grandmother figure for me. And we would just talk on the phone and she'd give me advice. But B. Arthur was B. Arthur and Betty White <laughs> was Betty White. <laughs> and so, you know, we would, in between tapings, we would do an afternoon one and an evening one. Everybody would go and sit and have a meal. Mm -hmm. And they'd be in their bathrobes. And I'd be like, don't sit next to them. I don't, what if they talk to us? Like, what, I would, we would just, we're, you know, really, really nervous about saying the wrong thing or sounding stupid. Um, being too young, all, all those things. So, but I, we still really, 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 really appreciated at that moment, how lucky we were to be there doing that show with those wonderful women. I mean, it didn't get better than that. I mean, mm -hmm. if, if they couldn't make a joke work, you got to write a new one. I mean, it was just, there's no going down and saying, well, what if you do it this way? No, mm -hmm. um, they were the best of the best. I think that's amazing that you kind of hit your high, like when you were so young and then everything else was just candy afterwards. Um, so Lixi says she's a huge Gilmore fan. What did you think of the revival on Netflix? How did Can you we, think about what, how it- talk? Uh, I actually went to, uh, so we became very close friends with Amy on Roseanne. That's how we know her. Uh, who is Rory's baby daddy? I think we all know, come on. <laughs> An anonymous attendee. They won't even say who they are. Oh, maybe it's, uh, maybe it's Matt Zucri. Um, <laughs> well, there's some options there. There's so many options. Um, well, there was a, the clown or whatever she slept with um, at some fair in New York, right? It could happen. I always said, and I talked about this in the writer's room, that to me, Logan was like Christopher was for Lorelai. Very much in that world. Mm. Like her Christopher. Yeah. Um, you were in there for season five, you said. Five. So when she went to school, mm -hmm. she went to Yale and the whole, um, you know, introducing Logan, being on the newspaper, you know, he was like, hey, Ace, 
<laughs> uh, I don't know. It was just old timey. That was so cool. So we met Amy on Roseanne and we were instantly like, who the hell is this woman? I mean, she was just instantly brilliant. And so we, we just like had to talk to her and be her best friend. And we became really good friends and stayed good friends. And we would help her. I mean, because of her style, unfortunately, uh, for a while she couldn't get a job. And we would just, you know, have lunch and like, come on, you could do it. Or what about we pitch her, like, do this show, what about this? And, and uh, you know, she'd get a pilot and we'd come in and help her punch it up. And, um, and then she uh, did Gilmore Girls. And I only watched maybe the first couple episodes. I liked it, but, you know, at that time, you know, you're writing other shows and doing other things and sitting down watching a show regularly wasn't something I did. Um, and then we got a call out of the blue to meet Amy and Dan at the Chateau Marmont, which is a, which is a very old school Hollywood uh, hotel on Sunset Boulevard. And she said, come have martinis with us. I'm like, I'm there. And uh, we're having martinis. And she said, I'd like you guys to go out of development and come on staff for a year at least. And um, would you think of doing it? And I thought for sure my writing partner had no interest in being on staff and was sure he was going to say no. And luckily he said yes. And we agreed to do a year and we were just came on as consultants and then ended up, you know, just kind of taking on a little bit more responsibility. Um, but it was because it was such a small staff. We all just had to jump in. It mm -hmm. was very different. Roseanne had 21 writers. Uh, we only had besides Amy and Dan uh, in the room. We had five. Oh, wow. That was, yeah, that was not very many. No. Um, but I loved I just love the characters and I love the challenge of writing for these people. And, um, you know, when we got the job, I had a weekend to watch all, all four seasons. <laughs> so, I uh, just ordered in a lot of food and just sat there and I just fell in love with the characters and the way she told story. She's a great storyteller. Mm -hmm. So that actually brings us to a question from Diane. Do you know, do you have to know the character well enough to write for their personality? The jokes and quips always seem to match who they are. Oh, yes, John Belushi did die at Chateau Marmont. Not, not to bring the room down, but yes, that is. No. Uh, do you have to know the characters? Of yes. course. Yes, that's why That's why we had to watch every episode to know their backstory. Um, there's a famous story on Roseanne, a writer's room story, where someone was in the room pitching and was doing a story about Jackie, which was the Lloyd Metcalf character. And someone says, who, who Jackie? So it became the who Jackie's joke. It's like, <laughs> you don't want to be in a room where you don't know the main characters. Um, so, you know, but still when you go into a show that's been on that long, you don't know all the things that they've talked about or wanted to do or didn't do for a specific reason. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you're pitching things that they would go, no, we don't want to do that. Or, um, you know, we tried that and it didn't work. Um, have I ever thought, of contributing to Mrs. Maisel. No, but I did work on the Bunheads uh, pilot. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was there for almost every audition um, for the character that Kelly Bishop ended up replacing another actor that did a, the pilot first. Um, so that was kind of fun um, and helped her punch up, which means help rewrite the Bunheads pilot. Thinking that I would be on staff especially since I studied ballet and performed with Joffrey, but oh no, Amy. <laughs> Sherman, no. Um, I think she thought uh, Dan, her husband, was going to go off and do, I think, like a Flintstones animated series. He's done a lot of animation shows and that didn't go. So then she took us to lunch and said, yeah, Dan's going to come on staff. So she didn't have the money. Whatever. <laughs> Um, so that, that stung a little bit, you know, because I just loved ballet. <laughs> so I love dance. I just love the idea that they're doing a dance show. And I was, um, yeah, I was, I got invested in those characters. And then when, when she recast the pilot with Kelly, I'm like, I want to be there. Um, so. Connections, um, like the connections are just amazing. Like how you met Amy, uh, Roseanne, and then you. Matt, you know, like Kelly Bishop was in Gilmore Girls and then she's, you know, it's just amazing. Um, well, that's why you never know who you're going to meet. And when I teach acting or writing classes, just be nice to everybody. And that goes across the board wherever you are. You never know when you drive onto a studio lot, the person at the guard gate, the assistant at the 
sitting at the desk. Um, a few years ago, I was I got into directing and doing a lot of theater, and I was casting a play, and I thought of this actor, and I looked up their manager, and I just called this woman who was their manager, and she goes, you're never going to remember me, but I was an executive for one of the head comedy people at Paramount. And you and Jim came in like your first or second interview. And you were so cute and you were so funny and you were so like chit chatty with me. And I always remembered how sweet you were. And she's like, I will give you any actor of mine. Like, I just, I want to see you succeed. And, and she, Ruth Horn, you're so, oh, we love Ruth Horn. Oh, we had some crazy times with Ruth Horn. Whoa, Ruth, if you want to talk about that, we worked on um, Gung Ho together, the, the Ron Howard oh. show. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Ooh, that, was, made that, you round. <laughs> that was, uh, that didn't last very long, but made some great friends like Ruth. Um, she was a savior when, oh my God. Yeah. We had a showrunner who Ruth worked with a lot and he did not want to go home. He wanted to sit around and eat food out of styrofoam and, um, right Ruth. And, uh, there was, it was a seven day a week job. We had to go out to his house in the Valley and we're just like, can we have a life? Like there was no reason if you manage your time well, that we had to be working that many hours on a show that people weren't really watching. But um, I suggested Scott Bakula for that show. He replaced, that show encouraged me to go back to college. Yeah, it made you get out of a show business, right? Uh, <laughs> I love how she said, encouraged me. Um, she went running from Hollywood. I mean, it was so traumatic for all of us. Um, but that was a tough job. I, I learned a lot because I, I wanted to go there with a good attitude. And I remember like leaving my house. Okay, today you're gonna like go with a smile. And we had fun. We did have fun. All the the the, the volleyball, no, but also the racquetball thing and the the tetherball thing around the thing outside. Anything not dealing with writing. Um, but I would drive to the Paramount lot and the minute I went through the gates, my energy just went negative. Mm. And my writing partner, Jim, is very spiritual and he said, Look, we have a contract, we have to be there how can you find the joy in it? Mm -hmm. And it was a light bulb moment for me. It's like, I, I got to find the joy and, and it just, it just turned and I found I had to find where, how I can be happy in it. I don't know how we got into that, but, <laughs> well, I think yeah. it's important. Oh, but to be nice to people. Yeah. So just, you never know when they're going to come back around in your life. And, uh, and I, I didn't do it to, I wanted something. It was just, we were excited. I'm excited to meet people. So I was excited to meet the guard at the gate. I was excited to meet the person sitting there, mm -hmm. you know, uh, at the desk, uh, not necessarily the executive. Mm -hmm. um, and I think just our joy for life in the business just came through. Mm -hmm. It certainly comes through in your writing. Um, can I ask Kayla's question of what was your favorite episode to write um, in season five of Gilmore Girls? She has so many. <laughs> so many. Well, I have to say, I really, really liked um, Norman Mailer. Uh, I'm pregnant. Because um, <laughs> that was another full circle moment. When I was in New York, my last year of um, working there, I worked in a casting office. And we cast a play that Norman Mailer wrote about Marilyn Monroe. I was casting oh, no. Marilyn Monroe. So that was really fun. And I didn't really get to know him. But then when we talked about who it should be and Norma Mailer's name came up and I was like, oh my God, that'd be so great. I don't, I mean, you could use my name, but he'll never remember. And he said yes right away, as long as we put his son in the, in the script. So that's why he's sitting there with the reporter was uh, Norman Mailer's son. <laughs> so while he was filming, I, I said, Jim, we're marching over there and I'm gonna just, you know, I wanted that moment of, I don't like having regrets. So I just had to go over and say, hey, you know, I don't remember me in the play and blah, 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 blah. So mm -hmm. that was really cool. And it gave really great stuff for the wonderful Melissa Mc McCarthy. It was just a funny storyline for her. Mm -hmm. Did you know that she would be a breakout actor from that show? I knew she was brilliant, but I didn't know the heights of like Bridesmaids. So um, <laughs> when we were on uh, the lot studio, CBS studio lot, um, doing our lifetime sitcom, Rita Rocks, my friend was directing a Jennifer Lopez uh, movie, J-Lo, I guess we should say, uh, The Backup Plan. So I went over to the soundstage to just say hi to him. And there was a, a scene of a bunch of moms, pregnant women, 
And there was Melissa McCarthy. She's like, oh my God, Stan, what are you doing here? I said, well, we're shooting our show with Nicole Sullivan, like to uh, just like over the, across the street. And she just said, write me a part. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and I went back to the writer's room and I said, you know, Melissa McCarthy from Gilmore Girls and people are like, who? I'm like, she's on the show, Samantha Who, you may not know her. And uh, so we got some tape and we played it for people. And um, we brought her on um, as uh, a friend of uh, Rita's. Uh, That's funny. Uh, uh, her, their daughters were friends. And so, you know, we, how you become friends with people's, uh, yeah. the parents of, of, your, of your kids, yeah. Mm -hmm. So what was happening on that set? Because you always hear that Lorelai didn't like Luke in real life. And yet, and, yeah. Lorelai, and Rory actually got along really, really well, as you would you would kind of hope. So what were the dynamics going on on that set? Um, <clears throat> well, I thought I was going to be on set a lot. So Amy kind of dangled. She knew I was directing theater. So she dangled, you should hang out on set and learn about directing and maybe you could direct one. No, we were locked in the writer's room. Oh. We had to be there because her and Dan would be on set. So we had to like, it, because there were so few writers, we had to like keep that engine going. Mm -hmm. so we were really needed in that writer's room. Uh, so unfortunately I did not get to go to set very often. Um, so we didn't really hear that much of, of um, I became good friends with Lauren Graham. I really adore her and think she's so talented and so beautiful and just the coolest person. She's just cool, like mm -hmm. Lorelai. I mean, that's why it was such a great fit. I mean, it just, you just wanna hang out with her. Um, you know, we'd be in the writer's room and, um, you know, um, the guy that plays Luke would call in and, uh, I am very good friends with, uh, now Liz Torres and she will tell the story and has, you know, that he would complain to her about the size of his trailer. And she's like, that's not important, you know? Uh, and I kept thinking, why are actors complaining or writers complaining? It was during the housing crisis back then. And we were just, I felt so lucky to have a job. Like we had some security mm -hmm. for at least a year. Um, sometimes it just surprises me, the people that uh, bellyache about, you know, um, that. And, and, and this is legendary too, but he came to one of the fan festivals. And again, I guess I was very protective like I was with Estelle. I'm just thinking thematic. Um, uh, he wouldn't even say hello to Liz Torres backstage at the fan festival. I'm like, it's friggin' Liz Torres. We're all, I mean, bow down to her. You know how many, how important she was and what she's, everything she's done and all the classic TV shows and variety shows and theater. I mean, and she was your castmate. Mm -hmm. I just, I just didn't understand that. Um, yeah, and I heard some like he didn't want us to talk to him. I, I don't know. I don't know the full story. I mean, he's never asked me on his podcast, so. Oh, well, maybe you don't want to be there. I have a question about um, those connections, though, because you mentioned Norman Lear, and of course, Sally Struthers was on um, okay. whatever show. All in the family. Um, all in the family. And yet, then you were writing, were you writing lines for her when uh, in season five? Well, you write for all the characters. All the characters. Is yeah, that weird to you? Um, not really because, uh, she was so different as Babette <laughs> and because I didn't really get to hang out with her until years later. Um, and it ended up, um, this guy that I dated was very good friends with her and was living in her back house that she had. So suddenly that's when I'm sitting there in her, having a glass of wine in her living room. And that's when it hits me. Like. I'm sitting here with Sally Struthers from All in the Family uh -huh. or at the rap party, which Amy and Dan would not go to. Uh, we begged them to go. I ended up in, uh, it was at a karaoke bar and there were different rooms. And there was in the karaoke room was Liz Torres and Sally Struthers, both excellent singers, both belters, having a sing off. Oh. I'm just like, invisible on the wall just saying i how did i end up in this room so <laughs> moments like that i did take in like oh my god how lucky i am to be even in their sphere but i didn't really know them then and it wasn't until years later when i got so close with with uh 
Liz and Sally. And I got to plan for years. I've been working on having a surprise for Liz. So I was very sneaky and visiting Liz. And I see her like almost every week. Uh, she was living in the same uh, place where my mom was. So that's how we got super close. Mm -hmm. And so I kept waiting for Sally because she's always doing theater somewhere around the United States. Mm -hmm. So I finally got her to like, just get to the parking lot. And then I'm talking with Liz and I go, I, I'm going to go to the bathroom. I'll be right back. And then I walk in with Sally Struthers and it was like, oh my God, Liz was like in tears. And I was like, you two go at it. And they's like, no, you don't have to leave. I go, no, no, no. I, I, I'll stay for five minutes, but I really wanted them both to have that special moment. That's so interesting and nice that people actually make friends on these sets. I mean, you'd hear about how people are like, oh, it was my family for a year, five years, whatever. But it's nice to hear that actually does happen. Um, who is your favorite Gilmore Girl character? Well, it has to be Lorelai. Yeah. I mean, for a writer to write those crazy monologues and just it, it's so free flowing and your mind can just go anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and I love Lauren. So it was, you know. Uh, but, you know, Emily reminded me a lot of my grandmother, so that was really interesting to, to write for her, but Lorelai was just, it was just so kooky crazy. <laughs> I mean, it was just like, what is coming out of her mouth? And it could be anything. So that was very freeing. Mm -hmm. um, this is going back to Roseanne. Sarah asked, did you have anything to do with the scene where Jackie calls Auntie Barbara to tell her dad's dead? No, that wasn't our year. I wish that is classic. I mean, again, the way they dealt with certain things in a very realistic way, but also really funny. I loved that Roseanne was able to do that. And even uh, Golden Girls did that with the lesbian episode, which I wish I had something to do with. That Blanche was hurt that she didn't, that she liked Rose more than her. I thought that was so smart to go at that story that way. It was mm -hmm. so unexpected. And that to me was revolutionary and changes how people think about the LGBT community in a ways where you're laughing and you're not being preached to. It was just utterly brilliant. And that, that show did it so many times. Mm. Were you a part of the show? Now, you've talked about all these shows that were led by women for the most part. Um, the one with the, with the line about, you know, the night the lights went out in Georgia. Uh, yes, we wrote that one. Yeah, were you on that show? Or I mean, like writing for that show? Yes, yeah, so when Vicki Lawrence was on? Designing Women, Designing Women, yes. Oh, no, 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 no. So I thought you were talking about Roseanne. On Roseanne, there was an episode You'll have to read in the book why we had to write Roseanne out of the episode. Oh, no. <laughs> and so we decided to come up with a storyline about a character we'd never seen, but we had heard that Dan liked uh, another girl in high school. Mm. So we brought her back in and she was cast uh, with uh, Vicki Lawrence. I was a huge Carol Burnett fan. So that Vicki <laughs> Lawrence was there, I was like, oh my God. And Jim's like, do not act crazy in front of these people. He was always like telling me just, act normal. I'm like, but it's Vicki Lawrence. You don't understand. The night that the lights went out in Georgia, I have the 45. I'm going to bring the 45 and have her sign it. And he's like, you are absolutely not doing that. You cannot. Do that. I would totally uh, do that. <laughs> yeah. Like now I think people do that. But back then we had to be super cool. I'm like, no. Um, so on Roseanne, if you remember, we had the last little scene, which were called tags. They were always like nonsensical, weird things. And I was like, we've got to do the tag where Vicki Lawrence explains the, what the lyrics of that song mean, because they're crazy. Mm -hmm. So we got a chalkboard and she's literally saying the night she's going through the lyrics. And it was really funny. So I, I love that we got to do that. Oh my gosh, I love that you were able to insert something that you were really, you know, a fan of into your writing, into a, an iconic episode of an iconic show. That's yes. amazing. You have to use everything that you experience. Yeah. Mm, that was a question earlier. Um, we just have a couple, five more minutes. I want to ask uh -oh. you a couple more questions. What God, prompted I thought this could go on and on and on. It could. Are I'm going to have to do it again or do it in person. Yes, let's do it in person in October. Um, what prompted you to write a memoir at this time of your life? Um... I had come up with the title uh, and it started because I kept getting that question of like, how could you as a young man write um, for all these women? Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to answer that question in a book. And then I came up with the title of the girls from Golden to Gilmore and I kind of floated it out and everyone's eyes would just light up. 
Yeah. And then when I came up with the tagline stories about all the wonderful women I've worked with and Roseanne, people like screamed, you got to do this. And then I brought it up at one of the early Gilmore Girl fan festivals. Suddenly there were thousands of people that heard that I was writing it. I had pressure. I had accountability coaches that year after year, they're going, where is it? Well, what's happening? Come on, let's do it, Stan. And so I started outlining it. And then during COVID, I luckily, uh, through Kristen Carroll, got uh, my publisher, Indigo River Publishing. And I just drank a lot of coffee, coffee, coffee and uh, some sugar-free Red Bull. If anybody wants to do um, uh, an endorsement, I would be happy to. Um, and I just sat down and just started writing. And what I did was I found a place in my house that I didn't normally go. And I just made that my little sanctuary. And I said, all right, you're gonna go there every day. Like if you go for a run, you'll come back and sit down with your coffee and you will write for an hour or two. Mm -hmm. And I just get through a rough draft, get it, just get it all on in the computer. And I did. And then through wonderful people at Indigo River, great editing, they kind of forced me to write more scenes rather than just say, I did this, da 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 da, da. Make, make it, you know, dialogue. And, um, and here we are today. <laughs> yeah, uh, well. I experienced anti Semitism. Oh my God, yes. Um, uh, anti Semitism, uh, ageism, homophobia, <laughs> you name it, uh, it's been thrown at me. And I think that's what people are responding to with the book is, how do you get pick yourself up after all that and keep going? And sometimes you know that that's what it is. And a lot of times nobody says it. It's like those kind of things, they don't come out and say, it's because of your age or you're, you're gay or you're, you're Jewish or whatever. Um, you just have to keep going and find a way to either reinvent yourself or surround yourself with people that you love or very positive people um, and find the joy. It's really, I, I don't want to say it's surprising because I know people are people everywhere, but you always think of Hollywood as, uh, as being more accepting, more liberal, more something. It wasn't back in the day. And I also hear people complain about people in Hollywood and they're two-faced and all of this stuff. That's in any business, any world. You really got to ask for loving people and... Uh, and you know, a lot of them have showed up here today and, and, um, and I show up for them and like going to surprising Joanne on her birthday, which became a viral TikTok phenomenon, <laughs> her scream <laughs> when she saw me there. Um, friends are important to me and uh, especially chosen family. And you know, uh, I'm finding they're getting me through a lot, um, not having, that support in my life, except for those friends and losing my mother uh, two and a half years ago, my biggest cheerleader. Um, you know, I'm sure a lot of people have dealt with grief. Um, I don't want to, you know, get too emotional here, but, um, you know, when she passed, I, I didn't know if there, I wanted to live in a world without her. Um, wow. But I want to still bring joy. I want to bring laughter. I want to provoke conversation you know with like my play about suicide and Anne Frank um, that's really important to me and I am who I am because of her and this book is really uh, it's a thank you to her oh well it's we really really appreciate it because it really bring it 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 means so much to us uh, who have been watching the shows and not knowing the insides and wondering and um, it's it's a wonderful wonderful book if you can read it um, what is up next for you? This is your debut book. Will there be a uh, Girls 2? <laughs> girls 2. Someone said you should do The Men in Your Life. Oh. Um, that could be a book. Um, I don't. I'm not planning on one. Uh, I really, really, really um, thank you. Thank you. Big hug back to you. Um, <laughs> and people find me on Instagram. I do feel the love back and it really helps me get through, you know, those moments when I want my mom to be reading the book and, and not just in it. Um, um, I'm directing a play. Uh, I'm really loving theater and directing a, a, as much theater as I can do. Um, so I'm directing a play that opens April 12th at the Road Theater Company in North Hollywood called High Maintenance. Mm -hmm. It's about a high maintenance actress. So they're 
maybe a few that we mentioned today. Uh, so I know a little bit about that. And um, she goes to Chicago to rehabilitate her image by doing Ibsen's The Dollhouse, starring opposite a robot. So it deals with the whole AI uh, world and how that's going to change what I do. So I'm very excited. Um, it's written by uh, Peter Ritt, uh, a young Chicago playwright. Um, and doing hopefully my Latinx diary Van Frank again. And I think Yes, Virginia, which is based on my mom and my uh, housekeeper. Uh, I think we're, I may be directing that in Virginia at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm doing some book signings, Book Soup, um, on the 26th of March in Los Angeles. And the Drama Bookshop, April 16th. I, as a drama nerd kid in New York, I would just scour uh, the drama bookshop so that I'm going to be there with my book and plays. I have four plays there. And Tony winner, Marissa Jerry Winoker from Hairspray will be moderating uh, my talk back. Oh my gosh, you totally made it. <laughs> um, the thing that you forgot to mention, Stan, is that, and you might've mentioned it earlier, is that you're going to a fan um, convention? For well, I haven't been invited yet, but hopefully the fan fest, I have gone all nine years, so uh, <laughs> no pressure. Uh, but that's in October in um, Connecticut. So, that's right. I, and we're trying to lure Stan to Ashland because it's not that far away. So, when we speak uh, of in person, we mean it. Yes, I would love to. So, it's called thefanfestsociety.com. Go there. You'll get to see a lot of the Gilmore uh, actors, crew, hopefully me. And it's just a loving, wonderful group of people that um, I keep very close to my heart now. Oh, wonderful. So Stan, thank you so much. This has been super fun for me. And I think a lot of fun for people who are here. And um, I really wish you well in your next endeavors. And I look forward to meeting you in person, hopefully in October, if not at another point, maybe I'll show up in Connecticut. Who knows? <laughs> maybe. Well, thank maybe. you for invi inviting me to this. It was really super cool. And everybody out there in library land, um, keep going, fight those banning on books. Knowledge is power. Yep. Keep yep. keep at it. We have our we have our uh, you know roll call or whatever it's called. <laughs> but um, everybody have a wonderful night. Enjoy all the shows, and um, we'll hope to see you again soon. Good night, everybody. Bye.